So, welcome. Um, so, yep, leveraging automation for disposable infrastructure. Um, as with any sort of talk, give you an idea of a bit of uh, sort of about my background. Um, so, I'm a heavy Postgres advocate. I've been using Postgres for a long time. Contributor. Um, I've worked around and open source for quite a while, particularly with Floss UK, formerly the UK Unix user group. Um, and of late, I've been doing quite a lot of work in the, um, the clouds, particularly Google and Amazon as a company. We also do Azure, but that's not an area I've done much in. Um, but one of the things you know, about me is that um, I like to think that I know data. So um, took a few minutes for the penny to drop there. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is kind of give you um, a sort of scenario. Um, you know, the story and names and characters, everything is um, uh, fictitious, you know, identification with any actual persons, yada, yada, yada. Um, so the idea is we've got this coffee franchise, Mike's Coffee, and uh, they want to, to move their hosting. Um, don't entirely know why a coffee shop might have a web you know, presence, but anyway, they do. Um, so they want to, to move, move to the cloud. And uh, there's, there's a number of different ways that they can go about doing this. Uh, so, you know, obviously they're gonna have uh, some sort of plan. Um, so a lot of first forays into the cloud is people sort of use it for additional capacity or uh, experimental workloads and, and so on. That's not really the purpose of, of the talk here today, but that's a step. Um, first two approaches we're going to look at is uh, probably the most common, which is to basically duplicate what you've already got um, and you know, just put that up in the cloud, the sort of so-called lift and shift. Um, and the other approach is to sort of a whole brave new world, this you know, version 2.0 of our, our platform. Uh, you know, it's a greenfield development. So if we look at a kind of a lift and shift, um, it seems like a great idea. It's a you know, direct mapping of our existing infrastructure to the cloud. You know, our load balancers become, uh, say, elastic load balancers in AWS. Uh, our storage and area networks become uh, buckets or the elastic file system again in AWS, Google File Store if it ever gets released. Um, mineral operational change is actually required. So all your processes for managing these things, they don't need to change. It's just, you know, your servers are in a different location. It's um, perceived as a quick win. This is, you know, we're, we've adopted cloud now because everything is now in cloud. Uh, you don't seemingly need much AWS or Google or Azure uh, specific knowledge to do this. But um, there's quite a penalty to the sort of lift and shift. Um, you're just, you really are just changing the location of your hardware. You're, you are actually no operationally different than you were before. Uh, you see your instance sizing is typically based on what you've got right now. So this box is two cores, 16 gig memory, therefore we need an EC2 instance with two cores, 16 gigs memory, so on. Um, so actually you're still underutilizing your hardware. You haven't saved anything, you're just in the cloud. Uh, and the, the reality is you've stunted the scalability because you haven't addressed any of uh, your ar architectural limitations. So okay. We need a different plan. Uh, so let's just, we've decided that yeah, lift and shift just isn't going to get there. Yes, we're in the cloud, but it's not actually a benefit to our business. So um, we're going to do a whole brave new world. Um, you know, the CTO might sort of think of this as where you know, we're under investing in our future if we just do, do a lift and shift. So yeah, this is quite an appealing approach. Um, you know, we've got no legacy baggage. Um, we've got free reign to experiment. Um, we've, it's uh, another it's kind of low risk um, path to cloud adoption because you know, if it doesn't work, we just, we just switch it off. We still got everything in our old data center. Um, you know, there's no risk to that existing production environment so we can get everything perfect. Uh, and then at some point in time, we'll, we'll switch it over. Um, surprise, surprise, there's penalties to this approach too. Um, but the biggest one is that that team is often organizationally isolated. So they're doing all this fantastic new stuff and as you get this kind of jealousy breeding between those doing cloud, those who still have to look after the old world. Um, you get to this, this us versus them mentality, friction develops. It's uh, not a pleasant place to be in. I've been there. 
Um, the focus is actually usually on application functionality and the infrastructure that you're building on is just kind of a, an accident. You just do whatever is necessary in order to deliver this um, application. Uh, and these projects actually have a very, very high risk of failure. Um, it's this kind of carefree scoping because it's greenfield development, there's no risk, yada, yada, yada. Um, and significant time can be lost then trying to integrate all this back into uh, your existing platform. How are you going to migrate? You've completely changed everything. So, you know, are we really doing cloud if we take either one of these approaches? Um, and I would say, no, no, we're not. Um, we're not leveraging the power of a dynamic infrastructure. Um, you know, we've got this wonderfully fantastic scalable infrastructure, but is our application even scalable? So, some way we've got to break the mold. Um, I thought this was absolutely perfect, uh, the opening line to Peter Pan. All this has happened before and all this will happen again, but this time it happened in London. Um, you know, this really isn't actually a new problem. Um, the, the trouble is we've got to move from our comfortable past in order to do things different. Um, we can go all the way back to 1967 to a statement that Melvin Conway made, and he basically says that you're designed to doom, uh, sorry, you're designed to doom, you're doomed to design uh, your organizational structure. So whatever software application you build, the way it behaves is going to echo what you've, your organization does. Move on to the 80s, and we get the wonderful Fred Brooks. Um, he says that scaling software isn't just the same elements bigger, it's an increase in different elements that often interact in a non-linear fashion. Uh, complexity of the whole increases much more than linearly. Um, now, if we're just looking back to that kind of lift and shift approach, uh, we're not doing anything to address this. We think, well, we, we can now vertically scale, we can just increase the size of the EC2 instance. This isn't going to, to help us, we're going to hit these problems. Much, much more recently, in um, 2016, Keith Morris, author of the Infrastructure as Code book, he stated that uh, you know, applying existing patterns at best misses out on possible improvements with new technology, and at worst, it adds more complexity. And even more recently, last year, um, Martin Kleppman, and designing data-intensive applications, he says that ships, uh, systems should work correctly in the face of adversity. And that is a statement that we're really going to kind of focus on now. Um, it's all good and well having your stuff running, but how is it going to behave when things go wrong? And we've lost the screen. That's okay. It's just pictures. Um, oh, there it's back. Okay. So we need a different approach. Um, and how are we going to get about that? So we know that is our, the way our organization works often dictates how we build things. We know that scalability is not linear, it's not just making things bigger. Um, we know that uh, if we don't take advantage of new technology, we're not going to be really changing the situation. Uh, and in fact, we could be making our lives more complex and we need to be able to deal with adversity. So the first thing is we need to change our attitude. Um, and really, the attitude you have to your environment will determine the limits of your scalability. Um, the more you care about individual things, the more it holds your attention. In a truly scalable environment, you only want to care about the combination of many individual things. So if we look at um, the Iron Age of computing, as I like to call it, we tend to treat our servers as pets. We give them names, like Igloo, Husky, Snowshoe. We give them homes, loving, you know, nice racks, very comfortable. They could be on site, co-located, it doesn't matter, they're still a nice comfy home. And if they fail, you do everything you can to save them. Because the way we used to deal with failure was try and buy the absolute best hardware that we could. Believing that if we have the best hard drives, we have redundant power supplies and so on, we will be able to cope with failure. So every single one of these servers is a significant investment. Uh, yesterday, we heard about the kind of uh, the sunk cost fallacy, and actually, looking at these sorts of things now in retrospect, actually, that's the same sort of issue. You know, we've, we've bought this hardware, it's the best we can afford, it's been amortized over many years in a business plan, um, 
and we have to buy excess capacity in order to cater for growth. And provisioning time is usually weeks. So let's go and think about the cloud age. Well, we're going to treat our servers like cattle. Most of you have probably come across this idea of the pets and cattle before. They have identifiers now. You know, we only care where they are geographically. Um, if they fail, we put them down and we get a new one. So we're not quite so precious about these things anymore. So really, here, our architecture is our investment rather than our infrastructure. Or configuration is chosen, a chosen rather, for your current load. You pay for what you're using, and capacity can be added when required. Provisioning new servers takes seconds. But I would say that the whole pets versus cattle approach isn't going far enough. Um, in the case of lift and shift, we're you know, herding our pets. We're just moving them somewhere else. Um, we can look at things like scaling groups, uh, sort of a minimum, maximum one, so that if one of these boxes disappears, it immediately comes back, but we haven't really addressed the underlying concerns. Um, you know, how are we even managing these virtual servers? Uh, complex cloud init scripts, uh, traditional configuration management maybe. So let's think about a completely disposable infrastructure. Now, everything is a package. It can just be discarded when we're done with it. Um, we're treating now our things as single-use products. If you know, they're pre-packaged to deal with a particular purpose, it's a one-time thing. Um, if they fail, it's again, you know, we're tossing it away and we get another. This at least keeps some of the vegans happy because we're no longer dealing with killing animals. If they fail, sorry I said that, you know, we're going to automate everything. And that's the key to sort of moving on past this. Everything needs to be automated. We must never make a manual change. So, Continuous integration and delivery is a must. Um, repeatability brings reliability and predictability. People can do things over and over again. They get bored. They make mistakes. It's not truly a repeatable process when you've got people involved. If you script it up and run that script many times, actually that is a repeatable process because, barring bugs and other such nastiness, we are going to get the same results every time we run things, particularly if we, our stuff is item potent. So we can define build pipelines to ensure that the same process is followed for every change. It also gives us an audit trail for these changes. Um, and in uh, many instances, it actually starts to bring visibility to our value chain. So. With continuous integration, in most cases, our developers are already doing this. Um, they've probably been ha had uh, sort of Jenkins build servers for a very long time. Um, the output of continuous integration can be the start of continuous delivery. But one of the things I think with uh, kind of the, the continuous delivery and continuous deployment, uh, people sort of get these CD terms mixed up. Um, Continuous delivery doesn't have to mean continuous deployment. Yes, it's great if we can all get there and do 50 deployments a day, but we don't necessarily need to do there uh, to do that. So we don't need to be intimidated that the, you know, the thought that going into continuous delivery is going to lead us to continuous deployment. It can, but it doesn't have to. The key thing is every change should be deployable. So we want things to be tested, we want things to be gated, and if a change is not deployable, we reject that change. So what about our applications? Well, we need to either build them or rebuild them to fit a dynamic infrastructure. A lot of older applications um, have hard-coded assumptions around how your infrastructure works. Uh, this can take the shape of IP addresses, that we have fixed IPs, um, and that can be problematic if, you know, in many cases, you can just substitute a domain name and that's okay. But that's not always the case. In some applications, they really do expect an IPv4 address. And if you try and do anything different, oh, game over. Um, many applications are not cluster aware. That's not to say that you have to have clustered applications to run in the cloud, but you need to be aware that if you have an application that isn't going to behave in some form of cluster, you're going to have challenges around data resiliency. 
So you know, sticky sessions on load balancers can help with some cluster unaware applications. Um, but really, you want to be looking at moving from stateful applications to stateless applications. So we can start looking at some uh, contemporary approaches, um, a sort of example of postmodern architecture. Um, I like sort of equivocating service-oriented architectures with microservices and just seeing the kind of reaction that people give because as far as I was concerned, the way we were doing service-oriented architectures 10 years ago is the microservices of today. Um, the, the point really is it's about how you encapsulate things. It's, it's object-oriented design all over again with a different label. Um, but I like being contentious. Um, so. What we're going to sort of do is we're going to try and package everything so that we have a predictable build time that produces packages. Now, that package could be a Docker image. It could be a, a Debian package, an RPM package. It doesn't really matter, a jar, an ear, whatever. It's a package. The point is we are taking our application, and we are putting it together, and we output a package. What that package looks like probably is a reflection of our deployment strategy. So if we're going to go to Kubernetes, then Docker makes sense to be um, our packaging target. Uh, if we're going to be building immutable infrastructure, running base operating systems, well, then we probably want to use a Debian or an RPM package. Um, insert Windows relevant packages here, whatever they're called. The other thing is that we don't need to fear vendor lock-in. I have seen a lot of businesses wait a phenomenal amount of time simply because they don't want to adopt whatever managed service Google or Amazon are offering because they think they're going to get locked in. What you have to look at is, in you know, all honesty, is it worth spending the time setting up a resilient JMS uh, service to handle messaging when you could simply use the simple queue service or Google's PubSub? If you really had to, you could wrap this up in an API, and so you have a nice facade over top of um, the platform, and if you did then move to a different platform or you're targeting multiple platforms, you've only got to deal with the specifics of SQS or PubSub at one location. Um, but you know, there are operational benefits to handing over the complexities of a um, resilient JMS deployment. Uh, in fact, in the case of SQS, there is a Java library that already exists out there open source that wraps that. So if you've got a JMS application, you can just drop that library in instead of talking to whichever broker you're using, ActiveMQ, for example, replace it with this library. Now you can talk to SQS. The other thing particularly I highlighted with the sort of brave new world approach is that your infrastructure is code. You absolutely must be treated as a first-class citizen. Um, you don't want to leave this as a kind of consequence of the application that you build. Um, you want to design the infrastructure you're going to run on in parallel to the cloud where application changes. So we were saying just a moment ago about not fearing vendor lock-in. If we can target particular services, we can make sure the infrastructure reflects that uh, and make sure that we're not going to waste time on uh, sort of rabbit holes. We can also do nice things like mandate that every instance is part of a scaling group to start to enforce that sort of cluster awareness. Um, we can use exactly the same principles for our infrastructure deployment as we do for the application deployment. So we can have a build pipeline that generates our infrastructure and follows the same um, practices. We want, well we must, script and encode everything unless there is no API or tooling support. That's the only area where you start to raise question marks. You know, this maybe is very cutting edge uh, if you know, Google or Amazon haven't even produced a tool for you to use this in a, um, a nice automated way. Maybe that tool's not ready for your production environment would, would be my suggestion. Um, you want to deploy exactly the same infrastructure to each of your environments so that there is no variance. So that's the classic problem that we've all had in the Iron Age, where our QA servers look nothing like our production servers. 
Now, we can still parameter the sizing uh, if needed, so maybe we don't need uh, a default scaling group of eight nodes in non-production, but we want at least a couple nodes so that we can see what the behavior is. And indeed, the beauty of the cloud environments is that you can tear down your developments and um, testing infrastructures every day. You can set uh, scaling policies so that at 8 o'clock at night, for example, all the scaling groups go down to zero. Well, if we put everything in a scaling group, everything is going to disappear overnight. In the morning, we can scale back up to acceptable levels and we're saving costs, so on. Now we're starting to move towards actually making good use of what cloud gives us. Um, so our deployment pipeline actually starts to become the assembly line of our application continuous integration and our infrastructure continuous integration. We start to sort of piece these pieces together. And in fact, high cohesion and loose coupling applies to infrastructure as much as it does to applications. I don't think a lot of people have really made that connection. We're still so used to thinking as our infrastructure as a physical thing. Planning to fail will actually help lead us to success. Generally, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. We've all experienced that. We drop a piece of toast, Murphy's Law, bang, jam down. So we can test our infrastructure in our hosted environment um, and make sure that things are actually disposable. We just said about every night tearing down our development and test environments. Well, every morning when it comes back up, we can see if it still works. If it doesn't, this is a, this is a problem. If this scenario happened in production for some reason, what would our recovery be? So we can exercise this all the time. Uh, this guy is my hero of planning to fail. Um, I think he fails to plan, actually, to be truly honest, but nonetheless. Um, so we want to regularly test our disposability, you know, terminate instances at random, uh, and see what happens. Um, did, I wonder, did any of people used to go into server rooms and randomly pull cables and see what happens? I've done network cables on databases, power on databases, um, you know, I, whatever could be pulled, I have pulled. That's an interesting way to find out what breaks. Um, you could do things very similar in the cloud. So you can block all network access to an instance and see how it behaves. Um, there are tooling around this. Uh, Netflix's famous uh, Chaos Monkey and the Simeon Army can automate this. Um, we have a couple of customers that do run this in production to keep seeing what happens. It takes a certain bit of um, kind of kahunas to go for that, but you know, if you've got the confidence that your platform is going to be resilient to this, that's what you want to do, because that's proof. You know, our business is capable of suffering and you know, just getting by. Um, there are, of course, some services where maybe you don't want to be quite so aggressive as that. If you have to run an Oracle Golden Gate cluster, for example, you don't want to take both of those nodes out at the same time. Bad things happen. Um, but you should at least try and trigger failovers and make sure that if this node dies, that node will actually take all the load, does all of the uh, connection pools reconnect in a timely manner, and so on. Um, and actually, one real neat benefit of constantly churning these disposable instances is it helps prevent configuration drift. So on the flip side to this, availability and durability cost. So um, what you need to do is identify really the likely points of failure and assess how often will this failure occur. Uh, if you don't think of the, the, the Golden Gate scenario there, how likely is it that we're going to lose two availability zones and, and therefore have no Oracle cluster? Um, how do you mitigate against these particular failures? How do I test the failure to ensure that I've got the mitigation? And the key thing is, is the cost of mitigation worth the customer impact during failure? You've got to be honest and really um, assess the worth of your business. You know, do you really need to double your costs to run in multiple regions? Because what happens if a plane crashes in Dublin and takes the entirety of EU West 1 out? Well, I think we've probably got bigger problems than that. Uh, you know, the fact that your coffee business isn't able to be online. Um, 
last year, Trello, Slack, and quite a lot of other high-profile companies, including Amazon, uh, were affected by an S3 outage in the US. Uh, the status pages for Amazon were in the S3 region that had the problem. Amazon don't even mitigate against this. So why should we necessarily do so? But data is not disposable and is actually probably more important than your availability. So you need to test the durability of your data. Now actually here, user error is your biggest risk. Uh, how many people have had to restore a table because somebody ran a query in live and forgot a where clause? Yeah, quite a few of you, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the kind of excuse is, I thought I was in the test environment. Right, okay. So same as our disposable boxes, we need to regularly exercise data loss and recovery scenarios in development and our test environments. What happens if that user does this? How easy, how quickly can we get that back? Uh, do we have point in time recovery on our databases? If we're running in RDS or Cloud SQL, yes we do. Um, but if we've had to stand up our own database cluster for whatever reason, do we have that? You know, make backups and regularly test they restore. This is a personal pet peeve of mine. You know, I've got backups. I've been in organizations where you try and restore the backup and it doesn't work. Um, and if you don't sort of believe that this happens, this crisis in GitLab last February, honestly, read that write-up. That is a fantastic, honest, open write-up um, where the engineers who are involved are defended by their business for the mistakes that they made. Um, and there are quite a lot of lessons we can all learn from this. So to give context to people who aren't familiar with what happened, they were ex experiencing uh, performance issues. They eventually got themselves back to a point where it was performant, but their backing Postgres database um, was no longer resilient and they needed to rebuild the slave because they, it was too far too far behind, the replication lag was too, too, too big. Um, now they, they'd solved one particular problem and it had taken many hours to get there. Um, this next problem came on, an engineer who'd been involved in the first one stayed on. That was a mistake kind of number one, you know, too tired. He was on the wrong box, blew away the, the data directory of the remaining live database. So they now needed to restore from backups and they had four separate backup strategies and every last one of them failed. Ha, huh. okay. So, you know, this stuff really does happen. You need to test your backups. Make sure they work because a backup that's untested is worthless as far as I'm concerned. So, um, the other thing is that tooling is not the answer. It's just part of the automated solution. Jenkins solves all our problems. AWS solves all our problems. Docker solves all our problems. Kubernetes solves all our problems. Uh, well, the quote from Fred Brooks from 1986, no silver bullet. His statement in that, which wasn't the one I quoted, but was that in, in 10 years uh, time, he saw no significant technological change that would increase um, the um, ability for people to produce software systems. And I think that's still very true. Um, it, it can be construed that maybe I'm bashing Docker or Kubernetes. No, they're fantastic tools. But they are tools. They solve the problems. You know, the age-old adage that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And you can hammer a screw into a wall. It's not pretty, but you can do it. So tools help us solve the problem, and we must remember that. So go back to our kind of hero here. You know, how is he actually going to you know, achieve all this? Um, so, you know, if we kind of assume that he's got a, a front-end web application which places orders in a queue, uh, backed off as sort of to an asynchronous fulfillment, um, perhaps a messaging system, uh, and there's a back-end system working off a database to fulfill these things. And we'll just, for convenience sake, assume that he's already refactored to um, his applications for the cloud. This whole kind of process actually doesn't need to be very complicated. Um, so we'll set up a CI pipeline for the application, and the output will be an AMI image. 
We'll have a separate pipeline to um, execute our infrastructure and roll out these AMIs. Uh, the goal then is to promote our AMIs between environments until we actually get to production. So I'm going to use a tool, Packer. Fantastic little tool from HashiCore. It allows us to build machine images. You can actually um, run Ansible Chef or Puppet, so you can still use the same sort of configuration management that you're used to to actually configure the box. Um, you can even run shell scripts if you want to. Arguably, Ansible is just shell scripts and YAML, but, um, but this could be Docker. You know, this is just a tool that I'm using. And the reason I'm picking this one is that it's simple and everybody else is talking about Docker. So, um, very, very straightforward application pipeline. We've got some code in something like GitHub. We run a build, we run our tests. It produces a Debian package. We put that in an S3 bucket um, or a Google bucket, doesn't really matter. Uh, our packer is uh, run, which takes that, installs it into the base image. We now produce an AMI. Everything's configured, ready to go. Final pieces of configuration can be injected. Uh, you put placeholders in in the packer build. Uh, and those values can be provided as part of the initialization script. So the way you've defined your scaling group in Amazon can provide that last final piece of configuration for when your instance starts up. So, oops, I didn't change the headline there. Terraform, not Packer, but still HashiCorp. So another tool, fantastic tool for writing um, infrastructure. Um, it supports all the major cloud vendors, plus a whole heap of other things, even VMware. Um, not just infrastructure as well. You can configure things like MySQL and Postgres and, and stuff with, with, Packer, uh, with Terraform. There's a, a quite a few interesting ways you can abuse it. Um, but what's nice about it is that it's a great tool for, for collaborating. It's got this concept of a state file, which is stored in, a, you can store it in a bucket, uh, and it makes working on infrastructure between many people a lot, lot more straightforward. Now, there are other tools that achieve this. Again, Ansible, you can actually stand infrastructure up. And I'm not saying that's not a, a good idea. I'm just choosing Terraform. You could use CloudFormation if you're targeting an AWS. Again, the point is there is a tool. This tool fits well with my purposes, so I'm using that. We could be talking about Kubernetes if we were using Docker. Um, Terraform also allows us to separate out layers of infrastructure. One thing that's worth bearing in mind is that there are some things that you don't want to recreate all the time. VPNs, for example, uh, they get fixed IP addresses that you can't attach, uh, attach elastic IPs to. You probably don't want to have to change your firewalls every day. So you can separate our pieces out. Well, we've now got kind of our infrastructure pipeline here, so we've got maybe multiple sources of different AMIs, and we've got the Terraform code itself in GitHub. These things change, we can run Terraform. Um, we can run some integration tests in our development environment to make sure that things are still behaving. Maybe there's been a change in one of the AMIs and a service that's supposed to start doesn't start up, so a port we're expecting to be open isn't now open. We can then approve that and promote it through each successive environment. Uh, one of the sort of criticisms of Terraform is the wonderful error message that Terraform does not roll back in the face of errors. Um, well, okay, true, it does not, and that can be problematic, but if you are doing exactly the same thing over and over again, our repeatability, we should know that if it worked in our development environment, it should work in our test and it should work in our production. We shouldn't see that error message. So in the end, we have an infrastructure that perhaps looks like this. We've got Route 53 on the outside into an elastic load balancer to a scaling group that spans multiple availability zones with uh, scaling groups, you know, a number, variable number of instances between them. They talk to a simple queuing service, managed service. We're not vendor locked. We could move to a different JMS platform if we needed to. There's another set of um, instances, again, across multiple availability zones and into a, um, a database. And we can have a read replica in another region. And if we do need to do some sort of region failover because that plane has now crashed in Dublin, well, we just need to run Terraform to stand up the rest of our, our infrastructure. Uh, we've got a DR strategy here that maybe takes 10 minutes, 20 minutes to implement. 
Um, we don't have to run twice the infrastructure just in case of that scenario. And I think 20 minutes to recover from a region loss is probably acceptable to your business. So just to sort of summarize, you gotta have an attitude that stuff is gonna be throwaway. Uh, we don't wanna carry over the way we've always built things. We need to change how we've done things. We need to be continuous. We've got to refactor to the cloud in order to leverage what's there. Our infrastructure is code. Um, we must plan to fail. Data is king. And tooling is not the answer. It is part of the answer. <laughs>